Hi there, um, welcome to our latest Artemis Live webcast, first one we've done for a little while. I'm glad to have with me today Peter Giacone, who's Managing Director and Global Head of Insurance at Kroll Bond Rating Agency. You know, obviously KBRA is a well-known rating agency in the financial world and increasingly in the insurance world as well. And Peter's going to share some thoughts today with us on the evolving investor appetite quite generally around capital markets and what that means more specifically for insurance linked securities. Um, so Peter, welcome. Thank you, Steve. Good to be with you today and uh, thanks for the introduction. Sure, looking forward to hearing your thoughts. So um, let's um, kick right off. Obviously, it's a challenging time for capital markets generally and investors around the world um, with the pandemic and the disruption that's caused. And I guess that's going to play into this discussion quite a lot. Um, but financial markets have obviously seen large amounts of money flowing into funds, um, particularly private debt and equity. And I know investors have been some investors in particular are looking to capitalize on the opportunity at this point in time. Um, sort of what, what do you think is driving this and how long do you think this level of activity can persist? Oh, that's, that's a great question, Steve. And, and I, I think you, you, you hit the word, the key word right there in the question, which is opportunity. Um, what we've seen is a tremendous amount of money, new money flowing into uh, these markets. Um, and there's also, even before COVID started, there was a tremendous record numbers of dry powder um, that we kind of commented on in the past in terms of what you've seen with respect to private debt and equity. Um, you know, I think if you look at the internal rates of return that vintage funds that were invested, um, say, post the great financial crisis, and you compare those returns with the sorts of IRRs that you saw previous to the last great financial crisis, so just to give an example, you know, 2005, 2006 vintages of IRR in the private debt and equity markets and, and funds were typically in the six to 8% range. Um, you look at the, at the IRRs cumulative that were uh, earned on funds that launched in the 2009, 2010, 2011, right after the great financial crisis, and they were in the mid, mid double digits, almost twice as high. So, you know, in talking to investors in the market, they're seeing very similar um, uh, opportunities due to dislocations in the market. And so capital is flowing very quickly to those to those areas, and then you know, clearly uh, asset managers and, and insurance companies as well are trying to take advantage of those opportunities as they see them come along, and they know the window may close. So, uh, you know, I think the, the to the point of how much further and longer this will go on, um, I'd say probably as long as we have uncertainty around COVID, um, there's going to be a lot of these up and down swings, and each time you have one of those dips, I think investors are going to be standing on the sidelines ready to take advantage to the extent that they can. Sure. Yeah. And obviously that uncertainty doesn't seem to be going away very quickly at this point in time. And we've got a whole winter ahead of us to, to see how the pandemic reacts to that. Um, obviously, some of this interest is coming into the insurance and reinsurance industry. We've seen quite a few capital raises and a lot of private equity interest in insurance and reinsurance carriers, um, and as well as some private um, debt um, fundraisers as well. Um, why do you think reinsurance is, seems particularly attractive at this point? Well, I think we've already seen a lot of reports coming out of the market of increased pricing. You know, if you look at the history of, of what has been happening uh, in the years subsequent to this, we had sort of very steady, stable increases in pricing year on year, as you'd sort of expect. There was lots of capital in the market, so, so no, no issue there. So it was almost a nice kind of counterbalance of sufficient capital uh, supporting liabilities and at the same time, you know, at least sufficient pricing increases to keep people interested. Um, the pricing increases that were being reported now in the market in some lines of business, 30, 40% uh, in DNO, for example, I suppose saw that the other day. Um, that, that's sort of a siren call to those uh, who like the insurance market and say, all right, well, now we have an opportunity again, just as we did in the private debt and equity markets, as I just talked about, it's a similar dynamic here where when you have that type of a pricing environment, that's going to be an opportunity for investors and those who want to get into insurance and reinsurance uh, to kind of step in with both feet. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I actually spoke to some private equity people in the last week and um, had some very mixed views from them on some of the capital raises in the market right now. <laughs> some some, private, <laughs> some of them, there, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity to put money to work, but um, one, one of the PE investors in particular thought that the current crop of offerings was quite uninspiring. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see if people can come up with something that inspires that type of investor, which I think will be important for the future of the market. 
Oh, absolutely. And the trends we're discussing here are those in the market are well aware. And so it's an opportunity, you know, if things shake out. And so you're going to have uh, certainly some, some great opportunities. You're also going to have some things maybe you need to be careful about. And some of the more experienced PE managers who we talk to a lot at KBRA for sure um, are, are, are saying the same thing. You, you've got to be able to shift the, uh, shift the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. Um, but there's some good stuff there for those who are patient and know the space. And we've seen a lot of M&A activity uh, across the board, and we're gonna, we anticipate we'll probably see more of that uh, in the time going forward. Again, a lot of creativity around structure and, and how do you get into the market um, uh, in ways that are creative and, and provide value to the investor. Mm, interesting. Yeah, and, and I suppose it, despite the fact prices are rising on the risk side of the business, on the investment side of reinsurance, things aren't really looking so great given um, we're back in a, well, we've been in a lower for longer world. People have been calling it for a long time, but now it's an even lower for even longer world, we think. Um, so how do, how do you think that's going to play out longer term for carriers and also, I suppose, for the, those investors as well? Absolutely. Um, and, and I think it's, it, it has become, you know, if you think back to right after the great financial crisis, interest rates came down. And if I had a nickel for every uh, investor and, and asset manager that I spoke to during the, that period who said, oh, six months from now, rates are going to go up. They can't possibly stay high, stay low this, this long for much longer. They need to move up. Um, and here we are a decade, more than a decade later, and, and things just aren't moving. And there isn't much sense that they're going to change anytime soon. So, so people have to adapt. Um, and, and that spells opportunity. And I think, you know, this asset class in particular, um, and, you know, in terms of correlation to other assets and investments that, that folks may make, um, is going to start to look more and more attractive. Um, the stretch for yield is never going to go away. It's particularly acute for life insurance companies, given their long tail liability structure. Um, and so picking up 10, 15, tw even 20 basis points on something is going to make a huge difference for them in this type of an environment. You know, that, that relative value differential as spreads start to compress, um, becomes that, that much more uh, competitive. And, and you're going to see, again, more creativity and, and folks seeking out because differentials that potentially, you know, at one point may have not have seen material are going to be quite material now. And particularly as with, the, with, with, with firms combining and becoming larger, the larger balance sheets will also allow more room for alternative asset classes and expansion into other areas like ILS. Mm, yeah, interesting. And I guess correlation was something I wanted to come on to just um, because obviously, the virus pandemic has shown that um, pretty much every asset class has been correlated. Even ILS had a degree of correlation based on the liquidity needs of investors, as we similar to seen in the financial crisis 2008. Um, but it does mean investors seem to be looking for something new or different. And that um, sort of the, the, the factor of the correlation itself or the correlation benefit, um, that could be something that just drives people in the ILS markets direction, do you think? Oh, I think without a doubt, um, you know, again, I think in, in, in correlation, I think sometimes people, when you think about it, think of it as a static number. And reality is it's, it's not. It's a dynamic number depending on the market you're in. So in a normal market environment, the correlations can be quite low. When you're in a stress environment and you can't get a, a bid ask spread on U.S. Treasuries, uh, suddenly there's no buyers. Uh, that's a very different market. And the correlation for assets and that asset valuations in that type of environment are going to be, you know, close to one. So I, I think, you know, here you, you, you can, you, it all depends on your perspective. I think a longer term investor is going to look at ILS and say, well, look, you may have some temporary dislocations in the market when you have that sort of high correlation, but over the long term, and I think that's where the prudent investors are tending to look, uh, over the long term, you're going to see that this is an asset class that clearly um, behaves completely independent of, of what's going on in, in a lot of other markets for the most part. And therefore provides a tremendous opportunity again with these larger balance sheets as companies consolidate as as, as more and more dry powder as i mentioned earlier um, looking for a home um, th these are going to be places where where again uh, scale will allow them to, to play in the market and, and get some real benefits of the overall portfolio performance mm, yeah and then on top of the correlation obviously the the firming of reinsurance rates is a also firming ILS rates. There was a report from Swiss Re out today that said spreads have risen 20 to 30% in recent issuances. And you add that into the benefits of a diversified um, asset class and it suddenly starts to look incredibly attractive, I would think. Um, just need to get through the period of dislocation, I suppose, in the capital markets. Oh, that's true. And, and there's so many public policy overlays on this stuff as well um, that, that come into play. Um, Folks, so, you know, at the end of the day, you, you, go, you go past the headlines of some of these things and, and you start to dig down, you know, that the private market needs to provide capacity here as it has done for decades. And 
um, it, it's, a, it's a very efficient and elegant solution to real risk problems that are in the world. And risk is an evolving matter, as we all know. Um, and so having these markets participate and provide capacity and, and be major you know, sources and, and, and be, a, be a major player with respect to a solution to how do we address these matters going forward, um, I think it is really, really key. And, and those are the things that are starting to come up more and more now as people handle and grapple with what COVID means in all these you know, various permutations and the various things that it touches and affects. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly for the catastrophe bond market at the moment, things seem to be relatively stable as well because it's um, been mostly untouched by the pandemic directly. No, no sign of any losses to any cap bonds, um, which means it's actually perhaps seems a bit of a safe haven as well. Yeah, it certainly seems that way. I mean, we're obviously in we're heading into the height of a hurricane season, so I'm not sure anyone's <laughs> sleeping too easy right now. But uh, in fact, I just got my power back uh, after about a three or four days of losing it. So. Even, even the non-named storms or the tropical storms can create headaches for people. And we're expecting to see, you know, some claims come of uh, this most recent uh, storm that came up through the East Coast. So, but, but I take your point and I think that's right. Um, again, the, the performance and, and those who measure these things and look at how these particular investments perform relative to other benchmarks that may be looking at um, is gonna provide some real uplift and some, some likely some good demand because it'll be a good fit for a lot of portfolios that are out there. Mm. And uh, what do you think about um, sort of the pandemic threat through the rest of the year and how that could affect ILS investor appetite if we if we do see a more significant second wave? I know I know the US has um, sort of struggled a bit in recent weeks. Um, some places in Europe are now beginning to struggle a bit with keeping case numbers down. Um, do, do you think that could be a real threat to sort of ILS inflows towards the end of the year? I'm not sure it will. Um, I, I guess maybe I'm uh, uh, to a fault to tr try to be optimistic. Uh, and I, I, but I do think that you know we've already been in this sort of situation now for quite some time. You know, in the financial markets at least, and in the capital markets, uh, you know, everything's operating okay. So if you have a respite uh, later this year operationally, I certainly don't see that as being a problem. In fact, you know, at our firm, we're busier now than we've ever been. So, and I think, and I've talked to my colleagues at other firms and other financial institutions. Um, the pandemic has not slowed um, interest. In fact, it's accelerated and increased the demand and interest uh, in various, you know, uh, aspects of our business. So, so I think, you know, from an economy perspective, I think that's true. I think, but I think from an investment perspective, um, I think the, the wake-up call has already gone out, and and there's going to be interest regardless. I, I think in a second wave, in some senses, there's some familiarity already what that means. Oh, okay, so we're going to shut down for a few more days, you know, a couple of weeks. Oh, oh shut down. We already know what the other side of that sort of looks like. And I'm not trying to be Pollyanna here at all um, um, or, or diminish the, the seriousness of the situation. But I think there's already in the market's mind a degree, as crazy as it sounds, a familiarity with, with the pandemic because we've been living with it for a while. So, you know, the bumps and valleys we know are going to be there. And, and I would almost argue are, are already priced in. The market mm. in some senses, in some sectors, is probably priced in another spike in, in, in COVID uh, outbreaks across the globe and, and it's already there. So, so I, don't, I wouldn't view it as a particularly significant threat outside of it just completely spiraling out of control, which I, I think with everything we're hearing with respect to the vaccine development and other things um, is, is, an unlike, an unlikely out, is an unlikely outcome at this point. Mm, sure. And I, I guess any the prolonged effects of the pandemic are only going to um, put more sort of impetus and weight behind um, rate increases in insurance and reinsurance generally so obviously a longer term that bodes well for for all investors in across it, reinsurance and ILS um oh, without a doubt and at the moment obviously quite a quite a bit of uh, capital um, erosion in the industry generally on the traditional side and the, there's going to be some on the ILS side as well towards the end of the year um and obviously the ILS market and ILS structures are one way that capital can be moved quite quickly and flexibly into insurance and reinsurance company structures. Um, but we're not really seeing, um, I guess by now I'd hoped we might be seeing some sort of innovative hybrid business models coming to the fore, but we're not really seeing so many. Are you surprised about that? Um, do, you th do you think maybe more ILS launches possibly next year? Yeah, I, I think that may be the case because uh, I, I share um, a little bit surprised, um, but I also think there's been a lot of distraction and a lot of a lot of balls in the air. So, you know, in, in this type of environment, perhaps people wouldn't be as moving as quickly. They're going to be just a little bit more cautious because it is you know, a bit uncharted territory. But but what you know, what I can say is what we are seeing um, from our side is 
uh, folks uh, and investors looking at this at, at ILS almost as a portfolio rather than looking at individual bonds are actually looking and saying, well, so we've got a portfolio of these securities. How would I look at that? Um, you know, and that's that's sort of where where rating kind of comes into play is to say, well, that might be something we can rate and, and provide some some value to an investor is looking at a portfolio of these things because it's a portfolio of assets and if there's debt or or bonds issued off of that uh, supporting that particular uh, portfolio, that's something that we we can rate. We do that in a lot of other lines of business, a lot of other asset classes, so it has a lot of similarity. So we're starting to see folks think creatively along those lines, um, but less so as you say in terms of the actual ILS structures themselves, which I know have have evolved quite a bit um, over the years. And, but I expect we will see that. I, I think it's just a matter of time. Um, but I think it's probably more of a 2021 event mm. than anything we're going to see coming into market for this upcoming renewal cycle. Sure, yeah. Well, that's interesting what you said on ratings. Um, do, do you think um, investors are viewing ratings as something sort of they would like to see more of in the RLS space at this point in time? I, I think it's in selective areas. I, I think ratings on individual bonds you know, are going to be, you know, sort of on a case by case basis, you know, you, you go back in history and you, you look at what happened with cap bonds, but cap bonds first came out 20 years ago, I'm not dating myself, maybe it was 30 years, whenever it was a long time, many decades ago, um, a lot of the, that paper was rated and, and it's because investors weren't familiar with it. As mm -hmm. investors became familiar and comfortable and they were able to do some of their own modeling and, and the technology advanced and all of that. And um, the, the number of those of those individual bonds being rated um, uh, seems to have dropped off. And so a lot of that paper goes out unrated and that's not perhaps not a surprise. But what you're seeing now is, is that there's now portfolios of these being created and there are funds that manage, you know, portfolios of ILS. And so their investors are looking at that and, and depending if particularly if it's an insurance company or a life insurance company that wants to put money into that um, from, a, from a risk capital, from a regulatory capital point of view, having a rated piece of paper on a portfolio of ILS is, is, is quite an attractive pop proposition and something that is perhaps a little easier to do today. And, and there's some tech, you know, rather straightforward structural technology to make that happen. Um, and that's where I think the rating can come into play. And, and, and also because it is a new asset class still for many, many investors. So investors who didn't consider this stuff before and are thinking about it now and need to go to their risk manager or their CIO and say, hey, I want to put down a, and allocate some of our portfolio to this asset class um, to the extent that it's unfamiliar and there's no one in the organization who has you know, expertise in the area, a rating can provide some real value and comfort and help them get over the hurdle of, of investing in something that's new and different. Mm. Yeah, no, it's interesting you mentioned life insurers because obviously there's been a number of different initiatives over the years where life insurers have looked to invest in catastrophe risk in different forms, but um, it's been difficult from a regulatory point of view, difficult um, because of the lack of ratings on individual cap bonds and things. So yeah, that's some, um, do, do you feel that that could be some a rated portfolio could be an attractive way for life insurers, probably US life insurers, I'm guessing, to actually put capital into the space and, and have it count against their sort of regulatory crap capital needs as well? Mm -hmm. Oh, but without a doubt. Um, I think it's, it, it, as I said, it's very, very similar to portfolios of private equity or, or any other sort of, alter if you want to use the term broadly, alternative asset classes, it's a challenge. And it goes back to our conversation of searching for yield. And that's the tension that these insurance companies are in right now. They've got a lot of locked in liabilities that are you know, at a certain interest rate and in many cases have limited ability to, man to, to manage those without paying for very expensive hedges or other ways to off offload that risk. So the only alternative is to pick up more yield. And where do you pick it up? You pick it up in these alternative asset classes, but that comes at a cost. And so if there's a way to, to do that at a more cost efficient way from a capital perspective, um, you know, some of that risk will still be on their, perhaps on their balance sheet at a, at a high cost, but maybe a portion of it can be, can be rated. And if, if that's the case, um, that, that's going to provide some real benefit and open up some avenues to investors that, that heretofore might have been a little bit um, precluded or the risk return for them, based on the way they were measuring it, um, just wasn't attractive enough or just didn't work for them. Mm. Yeah, also opens up some avenues for fund managers as well. Um, so that's obviously a, mm -hmm. a pool of institutional investors with a lot of capital to put to work who, for who catastrophe risk is a very good non-correlating asset as well. So um, yeah, very interesting. And do, do you think as the RLS market becomes increasingly complex, structures get more complex, do you think ratings become even more important just, just for keeping investors confident in the space? Do you think it's something the, the industry may have to just embrace more going forward? 
I think so. Um, you know, again, in the conversations that I have with with investors um, all all day long, um, what you hear is, is that because every company is sort of organized differently in terms of the way they an analyze and, and manage their asset portfolios and their various legal entities, and you know, we all we're all familiar with the complexity that's there already just on the investor side in terms of where the, the pockets of capital may be. So that in and of itself is sort of a complex thing, and then you have to marry that with with now an asset that has you know behaves and operates in a very, very different way. Um, the rating not only provides comfort, comfort in terms of the rating itself, but from our perspective, from KBR's, KBRA's perspective, whether it's a published rating or unpublished rating, we provide a fairly lengthy report that goes along with the rating that explains what we did and explains how the rating was arrived at. So the feedback I've often gotten is the rating's great. I really want the report because the report gives me something that I can then go to my investment committee and share and say, hey, you know, for those of you in the, around the table, which may be everyone around the table who are not familiar with this asset class, you know, take a look at this report that kind of talks about the structure of the transaction, what the risks are, um, you know, and what the risk profile is, and, and see if that's helpful. And so, it, so it's a combination of the, the rating itself, of course, that has value in, in, in just about every context, I'd like to think. Uh, but then there's also sort of how do you explain that and what's the, the work and the rationale and the research and, and report that goes behind that. It helps to educate investors about what it is they're actually buying. And so th those two things in combination um, can be a very powerful uh, in terms of, of, of uh, convincing or having an investor get comfortable and ultimately commit capital to, to this asset class. Sure. It's also a really important thing from an investor education point of view as well, I think, because um, that that's a set of information, another third party set of information that's available to help people understand what this asset class is all about, which can only be a good thing as well. Um, so, look, Peter, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate your time. Um, I guess for our viewers today, I just wanted to remind everyone that we have got a new webcast we announced fairly recently, um, which is on Thursday, September the 10th, um, 3 p.m. British Summer Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Time U.S., um, and that's kindly sponsored by Peter's firm, Kroll Bond Rating Agency. Um, so join us there and we'll be talking about reinsurance and ILS in 2021 and outlook for a COVID-19 world. So um, Peter, thanks again. And I'll look forward to talking to you then, if not before. Um, take care and talk to you soon. Sounds great. Thanks again for the opportunity, Steve. Have a great day.